Good morning. I'm going to be reading the poem, Some Things You Never Stop Looking For. This poem was written from many influences, and one of those influences has to do with the whole idea of losing, and losing things, losing people, losing boyfriends growing up, losing, the whole idea of losing and continuously looking for those things that you have lost despite years of growth. So this poem um, was written from that um, perspective. Some things you never stop looking for your mother's last words before she was ready to go. Those moments of lost days, your last image of her that had nothing to do with dying. That too lost the memory or memory to the image. Then there's the memory card where on a photo, you waved and waved at moments on their way to being lost, where the photographer was your last crush before you walked up or down the aisles with someone else. And the crush standing on the sidewalk as your wedding procession rolled by. Then there are those moments when you almost lost it in the birthing chamber, blood and water rushing out with the baby. The dirty water being spilled in the baby's eyes, and now someone has to save your last born from drowning in her own water rescue. But over and over you lost the hope of seeing it all, of seeing the bleeding, the stitching, and the rush to save you from drowning yourself in that sacred moment. That first shrill cry of your own baby and the finality of innocence. But you've never stopped looking for your sweet cousin who died in this same universal chamber one life for one life, your cousin Hazel, gone just like that. Someone told you later that the afterbirth can refuse to let go of its owner. But when the life that was birthed became lost too, after the barrier and the wailing, after the mute line of handshakes, the child also lost You've never stopped searching for the reason why. All the cherished spaces you gave up at adolescence just so you would become. How your own heart was broken over and over until you grew up to discover that the heart cannot become still unless it is broken over and over. So you seek out the steel, and with a slice of steel from your heart, you mend your heart. After that, you discover how sweet it is for the heart to be broken, just so you can carry something with a scar on your person. But you've never stopped looking for those lost places of childhood. Your father's house, where the river's flow had nothing to do with the river's flow. And here you are, still sitting solitudes, searching for friends you lost growing up, for friends you lost fleeing, for the friends you never had, for the friends you will never meet on this side of life lost lovers, lost kisses and hugs and the scar tears when you were only 17. What about your crush on your favorite teacher who couldn't even remember your name? All of this to arrive here still searching for a lost sock here, a lost boot there, a child's glove, even though the child now stands taller than you. 
There are those things you forever seek. The lost disc with your entire life story jammed into it. And the loss in your sweetheart's eyes. Where the landscape stretches so wide, even the eye loses ground looking. I hope you enjoy this poem. I didn't, I don't know, but I think I was supposed to talk about um, influences or things that influence my poetry. And a lot of times my poetry is classified as poems either about war or about looking for home or longing for home or trying to find home. And in a way, that is true. But I think everybody, every living person is somehow looking for something. And most are looking for home, looking for a need to belong, looking for a new place to hold on to. And so my poems keep going back and forth. I guess after you've lost everything in a war and country, especially when you you move to a place that has a culture you are familiar with, but doesn't reconcile to your culture, your own culture. You, and if you're African, brought up African, obviously you constantly are seeking home seeking for whom. I believe in um, a saying, I don't know who coined it, I don't know if it's mine, that whom does not become. Whom does not become. Whom is. So whatever becomes home is only in the process of becoming home, forever becoming, not necessarily home. Never arriving at home. Only that which is home originally is home. That's my philosophy. And from that, my writing branches on to everything else. Whether that home is about children leaving home, being displaced, whether that home is finding myself in a small town compared to where. I think the whole idea of home informs my poetry. I speak through the lens of another place. So when I see a street corner in any country, my mind takes me back to home, where I came from, where I belong. And that usually informs how I carve out poems. I'm also informed in that same mindset by the African oral tradition. My rhythms, my music, my images are informed by that oral tradition of my culture, which is so powerful that when you it is ingrained in you, it never leaves you. Besides studying African literature and studying other kinds of literature, this is how I carve up poems. My process is almost single. I see something or I feel something or my memory takes me to something and it impresses itself upon me to the point that often I have to pick up a pen or a computer or anything to begin writing. And I must write it down or lose it. Most often, my poems come out whole and complete. Oftentimes, I may write a string of family poems, related poems, related from the same large image. The image becomes large and overpowering to the point that it produces two, three poems. And those poems usually have something common with them. And then I may 
feel something and write down a stance. I, or maybe I'm writing something. I'm always posting stuff or talking. I talk a lot. Okay. okay. And sometimes I'm talking and people say I'm talking poetry. And so I go and think about it and I put that down and becomes a poem. I don't labor too much on, po on poems. And there may be one or two poems that I labor, labor over it week after week. But I'm not one of those people who spend a lot of time laboring over a poem. Because there are more poems to write. And I think I have so much imagination. A lot of times I have to stop myself um, from writing because, um, you know, poetry doesn't pay, okay? <laughs> well, this ends the discussion. I hope this has been great. And I don't know, it might be boring. Well, I hope you enjoyed the poem. Thank you, and Autumn House, for giving me the opportunity to slow down and write something and read something for your audience. Oh. <laughs>